Today we are continuing in 1 Thessalonians, so if you would take your Bible and turn with me to chapter 1. The page number, if you're using church Bible or the Bible I use, it's page 986. Page 986, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I want to read to you verses 5, 6, and 7. And I realize that we are already picking up in the, in, the, in the midst of a thought. We'll read the text as follows. Paul writes about the gospel. He says, Our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Verse 9 in this same chapter reads as follows. The second part of it, Paul reminds the Thessalonians of how they turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. They turned to God from idols. So, the gospel is powerful. The gospel has the power to take a person and to truly transform that person from the inside out. Idols can take many forms, can't they? What all idolatry has in common is that the idols in our lives are the things that captivate us. They're the things we turn to, we look to, in order to give us pleasure or security. The idols are the things that we think meet our needs. Our deep idols, these are the, the things in our lives that we think we cannot live without. And, and all of that is, is why idolatry is so difficult to uproot. Because you're asking people to give up the issues that bring them pleasure, bring them security, give meaning to their lives. You're asking them to give up their God. And who wants to do that? In fact, I would say that the language I used a moment ago isn't really sufficient. I don't think you can uproot <coughs> idols. You can only replace them. Because if you uproot an idol, you leave a vacuum, which will be filled by a different idol. So all you can do is uproot an idol by replacing it, and you replace it with something better, which is, of course, the beauty of God revealed in the face of Christ. So, these are incredibly powerful words. A group of people in Thessalonica who had their back turned to God. They were walking away from him. The gospel was proclaimed. God was in the gospel. And they turned. They were walking to their idols. They turned away from their idols and they began to walk to God. 
Because their eyes were open, their hearts were warmed around the gospel, and they came to recognize, as I thought about it this week, I won't go into the story. I told it before, and I forgot the details. But the little girl who had the, the dime store jewelry, a fake pearl necklace, and she held tightly to it, until finally she relinquished it in order to receive from her father a real strand of real pearls. She gave up something cheap in order to gain something glorious. That is what was happening among the Thessalonians. And it's what Paul celebrates and what we've been celebrating as we've been studying this book a people loved by God, a people chosen by God, a people called by God, a people where the gospel is at work among them. And so back in verse 5, Paul begins to describe for us how this happened and how it happens even today. It's through the power of the gospel preached, it's also through the example that Paul and his companions set for the Thessalonians. But look at verse 5. He says, Our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with deep or full conviction. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I was not prepared for this text. And what I mean by that is that for me, the next sermon is always on my mind. Because there's always a Sunday coming. And so I can assure you, I've already looked at the next words in this text, because next Sunday we'll be here soon. But I was unprepared for the first part of verse 5. I had my own thought in mind what I would preach today, and it didn't involve what I just read to you. And so in that sense, the text caught me unaware, it caught me off guard. But you know, expository preaching can do that. Because the goal of expository preaching is I'm not preaching my ideas, I'm trying to discover God's ideas and allow that truth to shape my mind and my heart and then share with you how God has shaped me through what I've learned. Now, I'm not saying that what I discovered in verse 5 was novel or new to me, but I wasn't expecting to find it here. And what it did do for me is it encouraged my faith greatly. So what is Paul saying here? He says again, first of all, the gospel came to you not in word only. Now, I think that means that what Paul preach. Of course, he preached the content of the gospel, did he not? In fact, we're given a summary of that back in Acts 17. He came into this city, he preached Christ and Christ crucified. It goes on to say, he argued, he persuaded from the Old Testament that Jesus was the promised Messiah come in fulfillment of prophecy. Undoubtedly, he preached that Christ is the way to get to God. You come to the Father through the Son. He probably preached that God the Father is a giving and ascending God. He is the one who gave and sent Christ into the world. I assume he preached that you're not saved by your performance. This is not a religious-based performance reality. Instead, you are saved by the performance of Christ. 
I'm sure he took them into the Old Testament. He showed them passages, perhaps like Isaiah 53. We all like sheep have gone astray, but he, God the Father, has placed upon God the Son the iniquity, the sin of us all. So he had a content to what he preached. But what this text is pointing out when it says, the gospel that I preached, it came to you not only in word, but also in power. He's saying, the content of the gospel that I preached to you, it was not a bare or a naked word. It was truth, but it was truth that God chose to bless. And so as I proclaim, and as Timothy taught, and as Silas preached, as we preach gospel to you, there was something miraculous that took place. The Spirit of God grabbed hold of that gospel. It was clothed in radiant power and glory. And as we preached, we felt the pleasure of God and His Word pierced into your minds and into your hearts, and it changed you. That's what he's saying. He's saying there is a power to preaching when preaching is truly Spirit-filled. And the preaching in Thessalonica was an example of that sort of preaching. It was a preaching that changed the contour of a city. It was preaching that turned the world right side up. And it was preaching that was blessed by God, the Holy Spirit. So, as I studied this verse, well, guess what? I'm a preacher. So that makes me feel good. But really, as I studied this verse, what it reminded me of primarily is simply the power of God at work through His gospel. It is a marvelous and it is a thrilling truth. It is a great reality that we should understand and celebrate and worship. Concerning. I was meeting with some folks this morning in my office, and now, of course, I've left my notes. And I was listening to Veronica, and I did not get her permission to share this. But Veronica has been coming to this church for about five months. She came to know us through the shepherding groups that meet at Denny's early morning. She gives more credit to the women's shepherding group. But she does acknowledge that Scott Zilke invited her to church several times. And she talks about how she saw something different in that group of women as she simply served them week by week. But as we met with her, because she wants to be baptized, and Scott Silky asked her the question, so when do you think you became a believer in Christ? So the shepherding groups showed her something which brought her to sit in one of these chairs. And part of her answer was, simply being here, somehow, some way, God worked sovereignly now, these are my words, not her words, but I think this is what she was saying to us. God used the gospel to save me. Now, she's starting to read her Bible. In the last four months, she's read roughly half of the entire Bible. Now, that to me is an evidence that indeed God is afoot in her life. And so that, again, is a reminder to us of the power of the Word of God. Whether it's preached, whether it's taught, in her life, much of the transformation is simply through opening the Bible and reading the book with new eyes. 
is God has touched her and claimed her, given her an appetite for his word, and he is using the gospel as she reads it, as she works it down into her heart, he's using his gospel to change her. And all of this is rooted in God, isn't it? It's all about God. It's all about God. But the power of the Holy Spirit to take the Word of God and to make it into a mighty weapon. Verse 5, our gospel came to you not only in word, not a bare, not a naked word. No, it was a word clothed in power, the power of the Holy Spirit, and it was preached with full conviction. That's what Paul's saying here. When you read the word full conviction, you are not primarily to think, although oh, this is true, that it convicted the Thessalonians. That's not the point he's making. It is true. This preaching was powerful and it convicted the Thessalonians. But no, what Paul has in mind here is not the audience or the congregation or the group of people who heard the gospel preached. No, he is making a reference to those who preached this gospel. Whether it be Paul or Silas or Timothy, or some other part of the ministry team that Paul was leading, these were men who believed in the gospel, who were spirit-led, and they preached this gospel with full conviction. They believed what they taught. And it was apparent to those who heard. Now as I read that this week again, this verse, it caught me off guard. And as I processed what, was, what I was discovering and seeing in this text, it reminded me of something I read not long ago from the ministry of Billy Graham. Now I realize, young people in this room, Billy Graham is at most a name to you. You don't remember him. But Billy Graham was an evangelist. And Billy Graham was a preacher. Now, I don't know a lot about Billy Graham. But what I read I thought was fascinating. There was a period early in his life and in his ministry where there was a real crisis of conviction. 1949. In November of 1949, there was a crusade in Los Angeles, California that involved hundreds of thousands of people. This is before all of that. <clears throat> Billy Graham had several friends, ministry colleagues, who doubted the authority of the Bible. And these men had Graham's ear. And he was challenged by what they were saying to him. So there was this period of crisis in young Billy Graham's life, a graduate of a Christian college, where he's trying to figure out what he believes on an essentially important issue, do I really believe in the authority of the Word of God? And I won't get into all of that struggle, but the struggle came to a resolution in August of 1949. Subsequent to that, in following years, Graham wrote the following, and I want to read this to you. As Billy Graham reflected upon his preaching ministry, he said this, When I preach the Bible straight, no questions, no doubts, no hesitations, then God gives me a power that's beyond me. When I say the Bible says, God gives me this incredible power, it's something I don't completely understand. When I pick up the Bible, I feel as though I have a mighty weapon in my hand. He's 
that would have never been the case if God had not met Billy Graham literally at night in the midst of creation in August of 1949 and given him an assurance that the Bible is truly the Word of God. And in so many ways, his ministry was marked by a conviction concerning the truthfulness of the gospel message. That's what Paul is getting at here. He preached, and those with him preached, filled with the Spirit of God, full of conviction concerning the message that they proclaimed, God the Holy Spirit was in that and used it to call the people out of paganism and to reorient their minds and their hearts so they were willing to open their closed fists and drop their idolatry and find something to replace it far more beautiful, far more captivating, far more compelling. They turned from idols to serve the living and the true God. And I simply say to you, all of it rooted in the power of the Holy Spirit using the gospel like a mighty sword in the hands of his servants. You know, we live in a generation, and I've got to be honest with you, I'm getting older. And I'm really set in my ways. I'm balder. But I'm thinner than a few years ago. But there were, in years past, I spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. And I don't think about this as much anymore. But trying to assess the culture, and particularly evangelicalism, I think this observation is true. What I would call mainline liberals, they do not believe in the authority of the Bible. Their churches are increasingly empty because they do not believe in the authority of the Bible. But it's very easy for us as evangelicals to say, we're not them, they're wrong, we're right. Well, in years past, as I thought about this, I really came to the conclusion that while liberals don't believe in the authority of the Bible, I think that many evangelicals do not believe in the sufficiency of the Bible. You see it in preaching, where preaching is no longer central to what the church does in a meeting like this one. It's a crisis around the sufficiency of the Bible. Oh, we believe in the authority of the Bible, but we don't really believe the Bible is sufficient for God to accomplish His purposes. So we're going to bring in all sorts of other in order to help God accomplish His purposes. And I wonder sometimes, is that rooted in, underlying that, is there a fear, a crisis of confidence that is rooted in the sufficiency of the Word of God to accomplish the purposes of God. How many times have I said over the years, the religious right, the religious right was rooted in a lack of the sufficiency of the gospel message. We will put our hope in a politician to save us because the gospel is not the weapon that we have chosen to wield, even though it is the weapon that God has given to us. So this verse fed my soul this week, reminding me the power of the gospel as God uses it, and it is preached, as it is taught, with full conviction. And that can take place at a booth at Denny's restaurant. It doesn't have to be a preacher behind a pulpit. But do you as a Christian have a conviction concerning the truthfulness of this word? And does that drive you? And does it drive how you share? I sometimes wonder those who doubt the sufficiency of Scripture 
Have they ever seen it really breach? Have they ever felt the power of it in their own lives? And let's be honest, sometimes I don't either. But sometimes I do. And when I do, it is glorious. So what was Paul's model? First of all, the powerful preaching of the gospel. Now we'll get to what the sermon was supposed to be about. The second part of this. Paul goes on to state, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. In my Bible, I have underlined the words among you. Among you. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Now what that tells me is that there was within Paul and Silas and Timothy, oh, and this convicts me in so many ways, there was an authenticity in these men, there was an honesty in these men, these were men who not only preached the gospel, they lived the gospel. These were men who were approachable. These were men who were among the people. So the gospel was on display through what they preached, but the gospel was also on display through how they lived their lives. They were among the Thessalonians. It's interesting, to the next verse, Paul talks about becoming imitators of himself. Have you ever stopped to take the time? I did this week, and I, I won't take you to these texts, but all the places in the New Testament where Paul says, follow my example, imitate me, imitate me as I imitate Christ, I still don't like that Paul says this. I mean, I understand it, but I'm convicted by it. See, I want to say, don't imitate me, follow Christ. But that's not what Paul says. He says, you imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, so talking at least to elders in a church context, he is saying, you are to be men who are worthy of being imitated. You are to teach life so that those who are younger can see Christ in you, not simply through your words, but through how you live, and they follow. But to be among the people, to be rubbing shoulders with them. Now, Paul doesn't leave us in the dark in terms of what this example looked like because the first half, actually the majority of chapter 2, is an explanation of what this model in Christ or this being among you looks like. So verse 7, let me just read some of this to you. Chapter 2, verse 7. But we were among you. Heard those words before? We were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. We were affectionately desirous of you. Aren't those beautiful words? We were ready to share with you, not with the gospel of God, we did share it, we proclaimed it powerfully, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Or verse 10. You are witnesses in God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. Now he says earlier, we were a mother among you. He changes the metaphor, verse 11. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom. So Paul is saying here that he preached the gospel, but he also lived the gospel. Now we don't find it in 1 Thessalonians, but I, before leaving this thought, I want to 
I want to take you beyond 1 Thessalonians to the Pauline epistles to gain, I hope, a broader perspective on this. I want to make this observation. Paul was a man who talked often about sin. Sin in the churches, but he also talked about sin in his own life. Didn't he? You read Romans 7 recently? I take Romans 7 as Paul's description of struggling with sin as a Christian. Oh, wretched man that I am. Or what Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 1, present tense, I am the chief of sinners. <laughs> So how could Paul say that? Well, I think Paul is more than simply reflecting upon his past in Judaism and how he persecuted the church. I think Paul's really honestly acknowledging that no one knows Paul's heart better than Paul does. And Paul can look down into his heart at the level of motivation, and he sees much there that he knows does not glorify God. And so he talks about it. You see, the point I'm trying to make is that doing life together, being among you, being a father, being a mother to the congregation, eldering, shepherding, it also means that we talk about sin in our lives. You see, the last thing that I want to suggest to you, and what a danger this is, I do not want you to walk out of here today saying, wow, good sermon. I know now how to live. I must have a full conviction concerning the gospel and tell other people about the gospel and set a godly example for other people. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run right home, and I'm going to cut out a mask. And depending on whether I'm male or female, I'm going to name my mass. Chuck Church for boys, Susie Sunday School for girls. And I'm going to get super glue, and I'm going to put super glue all over my mask, and I'm going to stick that right on my face. And that mask is going to convey to the world that I am Susie Sunday School, I am a godly girl, I've got it all figured out. Just be like me. If you do that, sin will rule most likely in your life. And you will find sin to be an adversary, both powerful and at times overwhelming. We have in this church core values. And I do not find enough opportunity to remind you of our core values. But I'm going to today. Your little tear out. I keep the tear out in my Bible. This is a description of what we believe a mature Christian looks like. Not everyone relates to this point right now, as several do. We value dependence. We value relationships of love, trust, and acceptance that give people the freedom to talk about their deepest burdens and struggles, including the setting sin issues. We value transformation that is rooted in working really hard and burning your mask all day long and lying to yourself and to everyone else. No, we value transformation as rooted in believing the gospel message that through faith in Christ, incredible, we are accepted, significant, and secure in God's sight. Can you say amen to this? I know you're Baptist. <laughs> we are accepted by God. We are significant to God. We are secure in our relationship with God. No matter how much progress you make in the Christian life, 20 years down the road, you might be far more godly than you are right now. You will not be any more acceptable to God than you are right now. 
We are accepted, significant, secure. We believe it's the gospel that transforms us. We value shepherding that meets people in the midst of their spiritual journey and seeks to disciple them to greater maturity in Christ. You see, those core values, they're all about being open, being real, being authentic, having right conversations that are centered around the gospel. I just want to simply say to you that if you read these words, Paul's method of ministry, preach a compelling gospel, and live a really godly life, if you read that second point as that means I cannot be authentic about the sin struggles in my own life, then you're not reading the New Testament as you should. You're not reading it right. Now, I've got some notes here. I just want to read this to you because I work hard at this. Faulty thinking. I must be godly and therefore I cannot expose my sin. I will put on my mask, attach it with super glue, and I will hide my sin from others for godliness' sake. Right thinking. Godliness means that I must expose my sin by bringing it into the light. It doesn't mean that I share everything with everyone. But it does mean that I have right relationships with other Christians that allow me to talk about deep sin issues. Godliness, listen to this. Godliness does not mean sinlessness. It means taking sin serious enough to entrust other mature Christians with it and with me. Paul came into this city and he did ministry in such a way that he describes it as a ministry among so I ask you, do you have right relationship with other Christians, people who you trust, who you know have your back, who you are able to go to them and to say, I need help in this aspect of my life. And to realize that the church gives you the freedom to do this. And we will not look upon you and say, what a godless person he is. Instead, we will say, this is a step of godliness. Because you want to live the Christian life in a way that does honor God to live that life well. Now, as we come to a conclusion this morning, I just simply want to point out to you how radically simple Paul's philosophy of ministry is. Do you see that? Can you see it's not about a bunch of programs? I mean, we don't read here, Paul came into Thessalonica and he brought all his programs. All of a sudden he had a suitcase full of programs. Let's see what's going to work in Thessalonica as you open your suitcase. Well, let's try this program. Well, no, that didn't work so well. We'll try this program. The third time is the charm. Churches can be built that way, but that is not what we find in Paul and his ministry. What we do find is the faithful preaching of the Word of God, and what we do find is really authentic, righteous living. And that means not being sinless, it means being honest, and allowing the gospel to change people one step at a time. But to be sure, the Thessalonians, they saw Paul, Timothy, and Silas, and they said, these men are different. And the difference, of course, was these men had been in the presence of the living God. It's so simple, but it's so radical. This is what changed the city and turned it upside down. Did it change the city completely? Of course not. Undoubtedly, there was much sin still in Thessalonica. This was probably a small church, but it was a true church. God was there. God was at work. 
That's verse 5. Let me read verse 6 and 7 just briefly. Paul goes on to state, You became imitators of us and of the Lord. The context here is suffering. The gospel came into this city and there was resistance, much resistance. Paul says, I was persecuted. Christ was persecuted. You also have experienced persecution. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia. Do you see the, the generational faithfulness in this? Paul and his companions representing Christ, children birth as Christ used them in the gospel. Those children who are growing in grace and making use of the gospel, their ministry is birthing additional children. And it grows this way. But as we close, I want to draw your attention to the word joy. With the joy of the Holy Spirit. In much affliction, the Thessalonians were a joyful people. I'm just talking just for a moment. Not new to you, but it's personal to me. In my experience, joy has almost never been something that I am able to reach out and grab hold of. I simply don't think joy works that way. If joy worked that way, then we'd all be endlessly joyful. Joy is incredibly precious. It is incredibly valuable. If you don't have joy, you don't have a life worth living, do you? If a man has every material possession, but he has not joy, he will be miserable. But again, joy is not something that I can just simply reach out like a commodity at Walmart and take it off the shelf and purchase it and put it in my pocket and take it home. <laughs> And so what I have found in my own life, and it's an ongoing journey, I have by no means figured this out, that joy is simply a byproduct of believing and functioning out of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is rooted to the reality of identity. Who am I in the eyes of As I go into my bathroom upstairs in my house, situated right above the potty, this is being honest, isn't it? My wife's artwork, Jesus joy, you are accepted, significant, and secure. But that's right. As I warm my heart around those truths, and as those truths grip me, I am accepted by God Almighty. Then what I find is a byproduct, so to speak, of believing and functioning out of gospel. It catches me off guard. There's this, there's this flicker of joy that finds its way into my life. And you know... When you have that flicker of joy within you, and this is what Paul's commenting on in our text, you can endure a great deal of affliction, can't you? The world can throw its worst at you, but there's something deeper within you, and it's a joy rooted in the gospel. And may that joy be radiant in our lives. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for a mighty gospel. A mighty gospel to believe and a mighty gospel to proclaim. Oh Lord, I pray that this word, which is your word, I do pray that this word would be powerful in our lives this morning. 
that it would encourage us, that you would give us full conviction concerning the truthfulness of your word, that your gospel would increasingly capture our hearts, that your gospel, your gospel alone is powerful enough to, to uproot the idolatry within us and to replace it with something more satisfying and more beautiful. And I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters that we would be a people who would desire to do life together, that we would recognize that strength comes as we do life together, as we share our burdens with one another. Christian life cannot be lived well in isolation. And it need not be lived that way. And it's again rooted in the gospel. I can, I can share my struggles because I am accepted and significant and secure in your sight. We rejoice in you this day and we pray in Jesus' name.